the sea so full of grace and mercy and we sing God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me Haunted by my past no more My innocence has been restored Forgiveness flows from your veins Your kindness shows in all your ways and we sing God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me oh God is good yes God is so good God is so good God is so good he's so good to me this never been never been anyone like you it's never been anyone like you you are worthy you are worthy it's never been anyone like you it's never been anyone like you you are worthy you are worthy hope is rising like the sun old is gone the new has come i fix my eyes on christ alone rock my shield my cornerstone hope is rising hope is rising like the sun the old is gone the new has come Fix my eyes on Christ alone. Rock my shield, my cornerstone. And we sing, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. So good to me. Oh, yes, God is good. God is so good. Yes, you are. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to Your mercy, 
O sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't hear. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. And all who are broken, lift up your face. Come home, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless. And all those who stray, come sit at the table, taste of his grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can cure. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are. So joy for the morning, a sinner be still, earth has no sorrow, heaven can't hear. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't hear. Lay down your burdens. Lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer. Come home, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you The gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of re redemption, the gift of renewal, Lord, for a life that was going nowhere without you. Father God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for what we just sang. We can lay it all down, and it doesn't matter what we bring. Lord, you will bring life to us if we surrender to you. Father, we lay our lives down to you. We need you. We cannot do it without you. Thank you for being there for us, Lord God. At every moment. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here, I find my rest. Cause without you, I fall apart. You're the one that God. 
guides my heart Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you sin runs deep your grace is more grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me and where you are Lord Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you I teach my song to rise with you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, teach my song to rise with you. Oh, when temptation comes my way. And oh, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you You are my one defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. and grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see 
taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, amazing love, amazing The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope assures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. will be forever mine you are forever mine my chains are gone have been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Let's just thank him for that grace. Can we do that? God, we give you praise and glory and honor for your mercy and for your goodness to us, Jesus. You're so faithful. You're so faithful, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, I thank you that... Uh, your word says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and we can 
find grace in our time of need, you'll give that to us. And so, Jesus, that's what we ask for today. In fact, God, your grace is sufficient for all of us. It's all we need. So, Jesus, I ask you that you would, uh, that you would do miracles, but, but God, we also ask you that you would just sustain your people as we wait on you to answer our prayers and to, uh, and to work things out for us. So, God, whether we need you to heal or we need you to provide, we, we need you to give us favor. Uh, Lord, we need you to restore something that the enemy has tried to break or injure or destroy. God, we, we just submit all those needs to you. We cast every need to you, Lord God. Every care. Because we know that you care for us. So Jesus, we don't put our needs into the hands of a God that we have to convince to uh, care about us, Lord. That, that's, that's, already, that's already there. So God, we're submitting our situations to one who loves us with love that doesn't end. So Lord, I pray that you would touch your people and give us peace and give us strength. And give us all that we need, Lord God, that we can move forward and do great things. So Jesus, we love you. We give you praise, glory, and honor because you're worthy of it. And we ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Now, before you sit, before, or, and that means you may have to stand, but why don't you welcome somebody that maybe you haven't had the chance to welcome yet. And those of you who are online, why don't you uh, say hi as well. Tell us where you're from, whether you're from in town or out, and uh, let's do that. So everybody just kind of wave do finger guns or elbow touches or whatever, you know. Just don't make it weird. Okay. Don't make it weird. Great. Hi, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. Okay. Okay, everybody. Welcome. If I if I if I don't stop you, they just keep talking. So some more than others, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, we started a brand new Bible study last week, uh, but I know not everybody might have been here. Does anybody need notes? You need notes from what we started last week over there. Jonathan, can you help me out, please? That'd be great. Yeah. You got them from last week, Joy? Awesome. Great. Okay. The Dahalskis need them, I think. Anybody else? Everybody else good? All right, and I believe that we actually have a link to our notes for those of you who are online. So you could actually click something and, and it'll pop up and uh, there you go. Don't you love technology? It's kind of neat. So uh, yeah, so you can get the notes online. 
It's a cool world that we live in. How's everybody doing? Good? We all right? We all right? Beautiful day God gave us here today. I enjoyed just staring out my window <laughs> and wishing I was golfing with my friends. But hey, nevertheless, I came to work for you people. So here we are. Uh, just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, we, we started a brand new study in 1 Peter. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there or click there, whatever works for you. And we, we covered a ton of ground uh, last week. Uh, we, we covered verse 1 and verse 2. And so that, that was pretty incredible. And today, though, I think we're going to make more headway uh, with, our, uh, with our notes today. And we're, we're basically going to try to go verse by verse in this book of 1 Peter. There's a lot to be learned here. Uh, this book was obviously written by Peter, and it was addressed to people who were being persecuted heavily for their faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, Peter found himself wanting to share some in encouraging words and some encouraging things with the recipients of this letter. And there's so much that we can learn from uh, here as we study it today. And that's precisely what we're going to do. So we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to go to verse, uh, we're going to start in verse 3. And let's see, did I lose my remote control capabilities? No, I don't think I did. Okay, very good. Whoops, hang on. Didn't I mention how much I love technology? Isn't that great? All right, awesome. I think we're there now, right? Yes, okay, here we go. So we're going to start with uh, verse 3, and uh, then we're going to go to verse 8. We're going to cover this section uh, that we've titled uh, A Living Hope. Okay, and by the way, feel free to ask a question or have a comment. That is fine, whether you're in the live crowd here or even if you want to type a comment or a question. Um, we have people that are monitoring our site, and so if there's a question that you have within reason, you can ask that, and uh, they'll give me the hey sign, and we'll do our best to try to answer that as well. Okay, here we go. First Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. This is in the New Living Translation, okay? Here's what it says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of of uh, change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you perceive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as the fire tests and purifies gold, uh, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though, do you, though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Okay, look at the first paragraph in your notes. Our living hope. In, in, in these verses, Peter links salvation to what he refers to as a living hope for every believer. The hope that Peter has in mind is based on the confident expectation of life after death that is bestowed upon Christians. Now, let's back up just a little bit, okay? Uh, Peter here is... Uh, dealing with people, as we said before, who are facing some opposition. They're facing some persecution, and pretty heavy persecution, too. Uh, it, it's, it's really, really, really bad, all because of their faith in Christ, okay? So for Peter, uh, a way to try to counteract that, a way to deal with that, was this expectation 
that there was something beyond this earthly life. Now, here, here, here's a confession from a uh, self-confessed church brat like me, having grown up now in the church as many of you have as well. And there was a time where we would sing songs and we would hear messages dealing with that moment that we see Jesus face to face, that moment when we leave this earth and we find ourselves in heaven. And, and I would watch, I would watch as the generation that was older than me, uh, and you can fill in the blank what that, uh, what that is and what that looks like, but I would watch as the generation that was older than me, they would just cry and they would just shed tears uh, looking forward to seeing Jesus someday. When I was a youth pastor in Columbus, we had this group, it'd be like our prime timers now. Uh, they were called the Golden Fellowship, and they would have a service every single Tuesday, and, and somebody would play the keyboard, and they would sing these songs, and sometimes they asked the youth pastor to come and speak, and it was eye-opening to me. I loved those people. I still love those folks. And it was eye-opening to me to watch them talk about and sing about heaven and what existed beyond <clears throat> what we have now on earth. But here's the thing. I've noticed that kind of my generation and, and underneath, like Jonathan's and Jessica's generation, we don't see that uh, as much. We don't see that expectation. I'm not being critical of anyone's generation, but I think our culture has fed a mentality that is very, very satisfied with what we have right now. And to be quite honest with you, uh, our culture says, we're cool with not going to heaven, uh, or at least not for a while, because we're really, really happy with what we have right here. I have heard people say, I don't want the rapture to come until... No, 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 no. And, and fill in the blank what that is. And I think that sometimes we don't really grasp what lies ahead of us. Jonathan? I was just going to say that I think with everything now that we have, I think my generation especially, maybe even like our 25, 30s and lower, have just become increasingly greedy. Hmm. Self-absorbed, that's a, that's a very good term. Um, materialistic. materialistic, yeah, yeah. Self-absorbed, materialistic. Uh, and so we, we, we've, we've lost something in the church, it seems. And so when you teach on this expectation of heaven, it, it, it almost looks like this weird fatalistic type of, you know, what are they all going to do? They, you know, they're going to drink Kool-Aid when the service is over and all die? And... and, and, and and people kind of miss the boat there. And uh, th there's, this, there's this gift, there's this glory, there's this wonderful thing that awaits us on the other side of this life. Uh, look, at, look at question number one in this section here. The question is, who has gifted believers with this inheritance? And how? And where is it kept? And as we read in the verses, Jesus is the one who uh, has given us this inheritance. And this inheritance is made possible. Heaven is possible through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I, I recorded uh, a number of... Uh, how many of you are watching the five minutes with Phil? I'm sure everybody is. Don't, don't raise your hand. And, and so... Uh, but, but uh, yeah, I'll just look down. And, uh, but, but one of those... One of those that I did recently was there was a statement that Paul made in Romans chapter 8. He said that uh, he, that, that Jesus had died for us, that Jesus had risen from the dead for us, and that he intercedes to the Father on our behalf for us right now. Three incredible giftings that we have in Jesus right now that we can say, well, you know, what's he ever done for me? That's what he's done. And this whole concept of the fact that Jesus' resurrection, okay, it, that's not just so that we can have a, 
a, a place to call spring break. You know, it, it wasn't just to give us a holiday where we dress nice and buy those terrible peeps that are just from the pit of the lake of fire. Anyway, uh, you know, not that, but, but he ro- <laughs> I hate peeps, but he, he rose from the dead for us. There's benefits for us. There's things that we inherit. The Bible says, and I probably should have put them in the notes, but I'll just kind of try to rattle it off. If Jesus had not been risen from the dead, then our faith would be hopeless, that we would have no hope. Uh, and now here, we have salvation that is secured through the resurrection of Jesus. So it wasn't just the cross that secured our inheritance in heaven, but it was also the resurrection of Christ as well. The most profound, historical, important thing that Jesus did for us was to raise from the dead. And that inheritance is obviously kept for us in God's presence in heaven, which is exciting. Um, Number two, let's skip down to number two. Does being kept or shielded by God's power mean that his children will not have to go through pain or difficulty? (laughs) Really? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Everything's been hunky-dory since I got saved. Um, (laughs) Wow. I mean, again, look, look who Peter's talking to. He's talking to people that are following Jesus, and yet they're going through intense persecution. I mean, we're talking about uh, in fact, I think I'll bring it up in just a little bit. Oh, in fact, it, it comes up here underneath. L- look at the paragraph underneath. Remember, Peter wrote this letter to people who were undergoing tremendous opposition. Some uh, of what they endured included being wrapped in fleshly in freshly slaughtered animal skins and then fed to wild animals. Others were dipped in hot tar or pitch and they were set on fire as human torches, and they lit up Nero's gardens at night. So by the way, American Christian, you don't really know what persecution is. Can I just say this? You know, some of us think we get made fun of and say, I'm being persecuted for my faith. Please, you know, I mean, this is nothing compared to places like Nigeria and China, and, or as our president would say, China, or, or some other location uh, there's some intense persecution going on. Now, yes, 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 we'll be insulted and ridiculed for our faith. I get it. But um, sometimes I think we need to really see the big picture. Agreed? Amen? Does that make sense? So anyway, anyway, as horrific as these, these things are, Peter states that the suffering here on earth only lasts for a little while in light of our inheritance in eternity. So I share this for people that might be suffering from like chronic pain or their sickness or maybe it's just been very difficult uh, in your life. This season is only for a little while. It's only for a little while. In the scope of eternity, understand. Do you remember the illustration I made? I think it was in here last week about a rope that was all around the entire sanctuary and just one small bit of it was colored red and the other, the rest of the rope was white. And that little red mark is our lives here on earth. But the entire rest of the rope is eternity. And that's our lives in comparison to eternity. And so here Peter is reminding these people who are going through such intense stuff. Yeah, uh, this isn't forever. This isn't forever. And maybe that's a word for someone today. Whatever you're facing that's negative in your life, it's not forever. It's not forever. That's not the way God's designed it. There is a hope that we still have. Uh, Let's go to question number three. What is one of the main reasons for trials? What's one of the main reasons for trials? And how is the believer's faith tested? Let's, Let's back up, okay? Okay, I get a trial. I get a crisis in my life, okay? Now, right away, how many know there's, there's two game plans going on, right? There's two sets of strategies that are associated 
with the difficulty or the hardship or the persecution or the crisis that I'm facing. We have the enemy's playbook and we have God's playbook. We have the enemy's strategy and we have God's strategy. So first of all, what is the enemy's strategy when we go through persecution or hardship or trouble? Stan? Steal, kill, and destroy, right? Jesus describes the thief that way in John chapter 10, verse 10. Steal, kill, and destroy. What are some other, maybe even more specific? Jonathan? To get us to walk away from our faith. Boy, that's huge. What are some others? I heard somebody say something. To break us. Oh, that's, that's powerful. Yeah. All these things. None of these things are meant to uh, bring us closer to Jesus, right? None of these things are meant to uh, make us feel any better about life or God or ourselves. That's the enemy's playbook. Now, let's kind of harken back to our text and what else the scripture has to say. Same, same weapon, if you will, or tool. Let's, let's use the word tool, okay? So we got the same tool. It's a crisis, whatever your crisis looks like. And let's just say the enemy knows how to bait the hook with us, right? The enemy knows how to get to us. He really does. For me, it's one way. For you, it might be another way. And so when that takes place, okay, now we got the enemy's playbook and the enemy's strategy. Now, what is God's strategy? God says, okay, the enemy has brought this calamity or this difficulty onto their lives. Here's what I want to do with this. What's, what's God's purpose? In the same strategy, same tool. Same thing, same circumstance. What is it? To strengthen us. What else? Bring us closer to him. Good. Paula? Mm, Good, good. Strengthen us so that we can help strengthen others. Good. We're reconciled so that we can minister the gift of reconciliation to others. That's good. That, see that pattern all through Scripture? That's great. To mature us, right? I mean, take a look at the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And I think uh, if you want to turn the page to page 4 in your notes, we, we kind of deal with that a little bit. It says this, Dear brothers uh, and, and sisters, when troubles come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. <laughs> okay, okay. None of us do that, do we? <laughs> okay. When trials come your way, yay, all right. That's exactly what I wanted, God, was really bad symptoms. Uh, verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete needing nothing. Hmm. So look at question number four on the top of page four. What's, what's the lesson here? Um, what, what's the lesson here? Okay, but before we start breaking out that fancy word that's on the page of sanctification, okay? Because some of us forget what that means. Sanctification, I could wrap it up this way. It's one of our doctrines here uh, in the Assemblies of God. Sanctification means I'm separated from the world. Number one, it's a two-step process. I'm separated from the world, and then I'm constantly getting closer to the Lord. That's sanctification. So when I say the sinner's prayer, okay, on one Sunday, with all my baggage, okay, God forgives me of my sin, correct? How many of you know I still got baggage? Okay, if I came into that church service with a pretty filthy mouth, I'm leaving that church service still with a filthy mouth. So I need to get that chipped away and become closer to Jesus. That is sanctification. That is coming closer to the Lord constantly, every day. God changing us, Jesus chipping away at my life, trying, trying to get me to be more like him. And sometimes he has to hit the hammer harder than others, but that's exactly what he does. Paula? Um, 
Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know anyone here that's perfect. Well, maybe Jessica, because we just think she's wonderful. But uh, I mean, th there's none of us. <laughs> there's none of us here who are perfect. So that's such a good point, because what's that saying? This process never ends. This process never, ever, ever ends. We keep growing. We keep getting sanctified. We keep becoming like Him. And the question here. On question number four is whose reflection becomes more obvious over over time Christ yeah the whole goal of sanctification is to not make you look better the whole goal of sanctification is to make us be a lot more like Jesus so the closer I get to him the more I'm gonna be like him I always used to say when 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 you see best friends, especially uh, when I was in youth ministry, girls, okay? Girls would be, okay, all right, okay, all right. And, and then they'd find some girl who doesn't even talk like that. But then she kind of enters the circle. Before you know it, she's like this, okay, all right, okay, all right, all right. And what's funny is the result of that, <laughs> that hurt my neck. And, and the result, the result, that is the result of, relationship spending time together okay that same principle applies to our relationship with Jesus the more and more time that I'm with Jesus I talk like him I act like him I I discovered that the things that he loves I love the things that he doesn't love I don't love and and it, it changes it changes I become more like him because I'm spending more time with him. Uh, Stan? So our persecution tends to draw us more toward Christ so that we look more like him and more like him. So that's what persecution is doing. They are perfecting us in a manner of speaking to make us more like him. And we don't really like this process <laughs> because, because the comparison is fire. Well, who likes to get burned? right I, but but that's what it is it, it's this purifying process and as the heat's turned up if you if you melt gold for example the sediments will rise to the top of that and the person who is doing the heating up whoever that person is he will he will scoop all the impediments and all the imperfections and all the impurities out of that gold making that gold very pure and again, that's precisely what God does with us. He, he will use those moments that the heat's turned on. And believe me, when crisis, when fire comes, you really see what a person's made of. Okay? If, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm looking to have somebody near me in, in a crucial position, I don't want to just see how well they act for 90 minutes in church on Sunday. Uh, I want to see what they're made of when difficulty comes. That's, that's, the true, that's the true elements of what exists in that person where God needs to work on us. And that's the thing. Uh, you know, I could praise God all day with, without a trouble in the world, but when there's crisis, okay, then the real fill comes out. And oftentimes God will use that and say, you know, you you've got this about you that really needs to go and and he'll scoop that out it's a painful difficult process but it's the end result is fantastic and that's why james says consider this an opportunity for great joy because who you are after this is going to be way better than who you were going into it bruce Oh my, absolutely, absolutely. And when it was over, God blessed him yeah. beyond what he'd had before. And uh, yeah, uh, th there, <laughs> there will be tests. We don't like those tests, but we go through those. Paul, ever, ever see that listing that Paul made 
of what he went through. I mean, beaten, whipped, hit with rods, had to escape the city out of a basket. I mean, there, that's quite a resume, folks. And, uh, but according to him, it was all worth it uh, so that he could become more and more like his Savior. Let's, let's jump to verses 9 through 12. Okay? And we got it on the screen for you here. Verses 9 through 12. Here's what it says. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they, were prophet, when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and, and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly, excuse me, eagerly watching these things happen. Hmm. Look at the paragraph right next to, uh, right in the middle of the page. Peter's focus now shifts from the difficulties of this present life to the day of Christ's return. His concern is that of our testimony, the fact that our faith, having been tested and proved genuine, will mean praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. Choosing to believe in him, though we've not seen him, results in the joy. Now, I underlined the last phrase of this sentence, and maybe you want to do the same. Choosing to believe in him, though we've not seen him, results in the joy that comes not from our circumstances, but from our relationship with him. Okay, we, we just identified uh, our culture. We use terms like self-absorbed and materialistic, uh, maybe even selfish, we could say, okay? How do we often base our joy? We base our joy on how much we have, what we own, what we don't own, how much money's in our checking account, what kind of car we drive, if we are able to drive a car, all, all these material things, how happy we feel, how good we feel, how content we feel. And the problem is that we are basing our joy on things that, number one, are, are very temporary, and number two, can change in a moment. It could change in a moment. So our true joy is not found in what our circumstances are or the things that we own. Our true joy is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, I love this kind of background look in these four verses here. How Peter says that the, the prophets prophesied about Jesus coming and being the Messiah, right? And And... If, you, if you've never studied those Old Testament prophets, I know for some of us, those books can be hard to, hard to read and stay with, but I'm telling you, you read the book of Isaiah, for example. Uh, you, you, in fact, do this. Do this. Go through the book of Matthew. Uh, the key word in the book of Matthew is the word fulfilled. Fulfilled. Matthew was written so that Jews would understand that this Messiah that they were looking for was actually Jesus. And so Matthew, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would say, Jesus did this to fulfill the prophecy that was written by, and then he would rattle off. All through that book, he rattles off. Jesus did this to fulfill this. Jesus did this to fulfill that. Jesus did this all through the, what we call the Old Testament all those prophets, they prophesied about Jesus coming. They didn't know when he was going to come. They didn't know what circumstances were going to take place in order for him to come. But they knew, that he, they knew that the Messiah was coming. And here's the amazing thing. They didn't get to experience what we are experiencing now. In fact, Peter even goes as far as to say that even the angels are eagerly watching. Why can't I say eagerly? I keep on going eagerly. La, 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 la. That's, that's not speaking in tongues, folks. That's just me not being able to talk. Uh, but even the angels, are, boy, that'll bring an email. Uh, even, even, the, even the angels 
don't get to experience this. That's pretty amazing. That's how significant this, uh, this salvation is for us. All, the, all those prophetic words. It wasn't for the people that were doing the prophesying. It was for us. It was for us. Jesus was the fulfillment. See, Jesus didn't abolish the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. That's why the Old Testament's important. We don't throw out the first 39 books of the Bible, for goodness sakes. Jesus is a fulfillment of all of that scripture. Everything that took place was pointing to Jesus. And then Jesus fulfilled that. And today we have salvation because not only did the Messiah come, but he died and he rose from the dead. Amen? Amen. I know I'm jumping everywhere, but let's go to the bottom of page four. How about that? We've covered five times as many verses as we did last week. <laughs> and we're about, to, we're about to do about 12 more. Okay, let's, let's read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 again, verses 13 through 25. Okay? Um, here's what it says. So think, again, remember this is the New Living Translation, so some of this might be worded a little differently than what you're used to if you're used to reading in a different translation. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But he has now revealed him to you in these last days. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that, uh, that was preached to you. I love that portion of scripture. Because um, what do we have? Now that we have this incredible hope, in Jesus and the fact that we're going to be in heaven and, and we can look forward to that day. Now we're getting instructions on how to live while we're still on earth. <laughs> okay. And this is important because Christianity is not a matter of just, I don't want to do anything bad. And, 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 and so I'm just going to wait here till I die. And then I'll just crawl into heaven. Wow, what, what a joyous life that is. There's your best life now. Hallelujah. That, that's, not, that's not the way God's designed it. That was my Joel Osteen imitation and nobody caught it. But that's okay. That's okay. I'll throw it in another lesson. Trump and Joel Osteen in one Bible study. That's pretty incredible. Uh, so we need to keep occupied with the main thing. In other words, we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. <laughs> we need not get diverted on meaningless stuff. You know one secret of being a pastor in one place for 20 years? I don't get distracted by stupid stuff. 
I don't. And, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody. Um, but I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be distracted off our mission by things that make no difference for eternity. It's just silly. Jesus is coming. <laughs> Jesus is coming. So it, we're not going to get in arguments about colors of carpet or, or, or it just, okay. It could be a dirt floor. We could still love Jesus, right? And, and we're not going to put it in a dirt floor. But you know what I'm saying? I just, I just don't get encumbered by that kind of stuff. I'm just, mm, I'm just passionate about thinking forward to eternity. So th this chapter is big for me because this, this is kind of my life. I, I, I am all about looking forward. Um, yeah, I care about what happens now, but I really care about what's happening in the future. Um, look at number one at the bottom of page four. As followers of Jesus, it's important to keep the main thing, the main thing, reminding you of what, I don't know why it says what makers most, it should be what matters most, so typo. Um, so I'm going to fire my secretary for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm my secretary, by the way. Uh, so what are your thoughts or your applications to the following commands that we saw in Scripture? Now, here's, here's a short list of what we just saw uh, in the Scripture, okay? So here's what I want to hear from you, okay? How do we kind of flesh these out? Okay, we got these commands. Look what they say on the screen. Be prepared. Be self-controlled, uh, or, or another version will say be sober, sober-minded, self-controlled. Number three, be hopeful. Number four, be obedient children. Number five, be holy. Okay, what does that look like in 21st century Christianity? Because Peter is talking to a bunch of first century Christians. So now how does this apply 20 centuries later to us? that are reading this. Let's hear your responses and your ideas. Any of these? Luann? Mm. That's, huh, that's good. Did you hear that? Learning to be submissive to what God wants and not what we want. Well, there, that's, that's crucifying the flesh and making him Lord, right? Paul, you had your hand up, I think. <laughs> ain't that the truth that that's that's a mouthful right there really none of this will probably come natural for us oh be holy no problem okay no one's gonna say that All right if, if and if you did say it you lied so you're not holy so uh yeah i mean there's a lot there what, what are some other applications to to us for today we see this list we saw it written to people that were being persecuted for their faith, some jailed, killed, tortured, whatever. Now here we are in the 21st century in America, and uh, we don't have nearly the persecution, but this list applies to us. What else? Stan. And that's from Philippians 4.8, uh, where uh, Paul tells us what we should allow our mind to be occupied, right? Isn't it fair to say that the biggest battle that we're going to have is in our minds, right? Wow, our minds can just... And, and here's the thing. Our minds can be very fertile ground to the devil's lies. And so what does, what does the Bible say? We can know the truth and the truth will set us free. Jesus even identified himself as the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, I, for some reason, I'm coming through the sound system. I'm not sure, but that's, uh, that's got to be the weirdest preaching experience I've ever had in my life. So we're like on a one-minute delay. That was pretty cool. Okay. He sounds godly. It's still going. It's still going. It's still going. It's pretty awesome, though. 
but yeah, I sound good. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, any others? Real quick. What, what's another application of this list? What, what do you find yourself doing? To try, you know, Paula mentioned that she's got to spend time with God before she leaves the house. What, what, what do you find yourself doing or what helps you nail one or all five of these for you? Study. Study the word. Okay. So, so study and know the word. That's big. That's big. What else? Don't make it too hard, folks. Don't make it too hard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be funny if we thought that, well, I really need help, Jesus, but this isn't our time. So, you know, I guess we'll have to chat tomorrow at 7. It's, I, I love, I love, I love that because for me growing up in church, uh, uh, having a relationship with, with Jesus was almost oversimplified to having X amount of time slotted for him. And nothing wrong with that, by the way. I think that's great. Okay, So if you spend time with God every day at 5 a.m., awesome. Okay, But there's another step to our relationship that Dan brings out that I love is this this constant being present with Jesus. He, he's with me when my devotional time is over. He is with me when my, quote, prayer time is over. And when, when some situation comes to me, he's there. He's there. And having that, having that constant uh, awareness of the presence of God in our lives, that, that is enormous. That's Huge, and I think that would change a lot of our lives. We we wouldn't compartmentalize Jesus. Okay, here's job time. Here's Jesus time. Here's breakfast. You know, and 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 he's with us all the time. So I love that. I love that. I think that's huge, Bruce. Some people say good morning to the Holy Spirit when they wake up every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what's that old joke? Some people say good morning, Lord, and then they look in the mirror and they say good Lord, morning, and. Uh, <laughs> and uh but yeah it, it's it's relationship it's relationship it's it's relationship number look at number two start taking your spiritual character development as seriously as god takes that i underline that in my notes take your spiritual character development as seriously as god takes it and god takes it very seriously so all these things that we could we, we see these instructions to a persecuted church, persecuted Christians. They apply to a 21st century American Christian as well. And God takes us seriously. And, and, and we should as well. We should be passionate about this. Uh, something we should strive for. Something we should devote our time and our energy and our, uh, and our everything to. Um, let me go down to verse 3 and ask you to answer a personal question to yourself, okay? Uh, question number three at the bottom of page five, and I'm going to close with this. One of the best ways to demonstrate a love for God and practice a walk of holiness is to see that we love one another deeply or fervently with a pure heart. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, how are you doing with this? To love one another deeply with, with a pure heart. Now, again, this is a personal question for you to ask. You know, please, you know, I hate everybody. You know, please don't answer that. But as I find myself falling more in love with Jesus, I 
find myself falling more in love with the ones that he died for. It comes, it comes with it. It comes with it. You know, this whole thing, well, I, I, I love Jesus, I just can't stand his followers. Well, okay. And, and let's just say that some of us, uh, we got work to do, <laughs> right? Some of us, we've made mistakes, and I get that. But we love one another, and not just surface, but there's a deep love that we need to have for each other that we're commanded to have as we see the end coming. And if you're not convinced, by the way, that God is getting ready to wrap this whole thing up, okay, just in the last three months, okay, corona, riots, murder hornets, Aunt Jemima, I mean, my goodness, you know, NASCAR, it, 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 the world is going crazy right now. It needs Jesus. And we need to be, we need to be people who have just a deep love for one another and for the lost, for the lost. Stan? And it's exactly what the people saw in Antioch. Behold how they love one another. Yeah. Didn't Jesus say in the book of John that the world would know that we were his disciples? Not by our services or our activities or our t-shirts or our wristbands, but the world would know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. What's amazing is that our love is probably the best witness that we can demonstrate. And, and, and again, I'll just say, when I get visitors coming in here and I'm following up with them, it's constantly, it's constantly how they were loved on by all of you. That's big. It's not my dazzling, it should be my dazzling sermons, but it's not my dazzling sermons. It's not my, you know, it's not our great music. I'm kidding, by the way. It's where it should be. Our love for one another, that's attractive to a world that just doesn't get what love really is. So I want to challenge you that way with that last command that Peter gave that church in chapter one. Let's one another, let's love one another deeply with a fervency as God's getting ready to wrap this whole thing up. So I want to pray for you and uh, let's trust God for a great rest of the week and let's trust God for a wonderful Sunday as we gather together again in his house. So Jesus, um, we've been challenged, Lord God, by your word to uh, really strive for a number of things to be self-controlled, to be hopeful, to be holy, to love people that, not only the ones that are easy to love, but the ones that might be harder for us to love. God, I pray that you would, uh, that your Holy Spirit would burn within us and that we would constantly strive to become more like you. I pray for anyone who's facing a trial or persecution or difficulty right now, God, that they would know that this is not all there is. But God, you've got a finish line to this, and, uh, and that's in your presence ultimately. So God, we can rest in you and your love. So Lord, thank you for your word today. We pray for your blessing as we go from this place, and bless the next few days as we try to serve you. In your name, and we all said amen. God bless you. We'll see you.